Ooh, look, an atomic weapon part. of methods, the entire family of atomic weapons, whenever and wherever necessary. On a typical spring day, May 27, 1957, a B-36 Peacemaker was flying from Briggs Air Force Base in El Paso, Texas to the Kirkland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This flight was a simple transfer of a Mark 17 nuclear weapon to the Kirkland base to make modifications to the fuse mechanism. The Mark 17 was one of the first atomic weapons to be mass-produced by the United States. The Mark 17 came in at a length of 24 feet, 8 inches, and weighed 42,000 pounds. When detonated, it could deliver a yield of 15 megatons of TNT. The Mark 17 was the largest nuclear weapon ever fielded by the United States operating from 1954 to 1957, and by the August of 57 had been retired. Only 200 Mark 17s were produced. There are a few survivors. One is located at the Nuclear History Museum in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The B-36 Peacemaker was preparing to come into landing at the Kirkland Air Force Base, at an altitude of 1,700 feet. The pre-landing checklist was underway. At 11.50 a.m., Lieutenant Karp removed the locking pin from the bomb release mechanism. The job of this pin is to keep the weapon in place, even if the release is activated, to stop any accidental jettisons from happening. This pin is removed when the plane comes into landing, in the case of the weapon needing to be jettisoned, due to an emergency such as engine failure or a fire, hopefully in an unpopulated area. Lieutenant Karp removed the pin as procedure would call for. The bomb fell from its holding sling through the bomb bay doors, shearing them off. This was not supposed to happen. The 42,000 pound behemoth began its fall to 1,700 feet to the desert floor. Once the bomb was away, free of the weight of the great green giant, the plane rose a few hundred feet in a matter of seconds. By this time, everyone on the plane knew what would happen. The bomb hurtling towards the ground with only the stabilizing chute to slow it. The chute did little to do to slow the Mark 17. It slammed into the desert floor, causing it to detonate, deleting a cow in the process. Now, this was not a nuclear explosion, only a conventional explosion of about 300 pounds of high explosives. A nuclear detonation did not occur. Due to slamming into the ground is not normal operating conditions of the Mark 17. Also, the fissile plutonium core, also known as a pit, had been removed for transportation. The device still had its second stage made from either plutonium or uranium, and its tamper made from uranium still in the weapon. The detonation left a 12 foot deep by 25 foot wide crater in the desert floor, sending shrapnel to the surrounding area, some of which landed upwards of a mile away. The debris was removed, the hole was filled, and here we are today to collect pieces that were left behind from the weapon. The drive to the area is a rough one at that. You need a high clearance vehicle capable of transferring off-road conditions. The site is located just south of the Albuquerque, west of the Kirkland Air Force Base, and east of the Mesa de Sol housing projects. It's hard to tell exactly where the site is, but using a combination of Google Maps and historical aerial imaging from after the accident, you can find quite easily a scar in the vegetation visible from past cleanup projects, where the wild plants have not yet recovered to the area that had been cleaned up. You can still find parts of the weapons all these years later strewn about, even after the few cleanups that have happened. The most common part I found was laminated cork, 
This material is similar to a bark-like material. I found a lot of this. The next material I found a lot was white plastic material with evidence of charring. There was little radiation contaminant on most materials, but the white plastic material had the most radiation contamination. I also found a different black plastic. The last material I found were metals, random bits and pieces, different materials made them up. Iron, aluminum, lead were the prime materials that I found, some of which still had the paint from the weapon on them. I personally only spent about two hours out looking for parts. If you spent more time, you could find plenty more. There's plenty more to find. I'm sure if you went out after a good storm or after a good rain, you'll find more parts as they'll become uncovered. The best parts to look is where no one else looked or in areas that weren't cleaned up. The cleanups weren't all that thorough, so you can still find parts of it. The most I found was of that cork material which is the largest materials I found. The large piece was about four to five inches but I found plenty of tiny pieces dotted around so much so that I didn't even pick it all up. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. If you liked my content consider subscribing. If you liked the video drop a like. If you didn't like the video you know what to do. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, etc. post them in the comments section below. If you didn't like the video, check out another one. I'm sure you'll find one that you like. I cover a wide variety of topics on this channel. Thanks for watching. Overall, it was an interesting site with a fascinating history. It's a must on nuclear tourism stopping list. You may even find a piece of history.
I don't know, but I've been told Uranium ore's worth more than gold I sold my cad, I bought me a Jeep I got that bug and I can't sleep Uranium fever has gone and got me down Uranium fever is spreading all